The Economic Freedom Fighters has launched its 2024 election manifesto. How should we make sense of this? What are some of the key proposals inside the manifesto? What are its strengths and weaknesses? And where does it fit into the overall story of this all-important election? Spread the fire, let's get into it. Welcome back to SMWX. So in today's episode, it's another emergency episode of SMWX. And shout out to my team because it's an emergency episode, but we are doing this for you with the cameras and all the bells and whistles. See, we deliver here at SMWX, unlike some other people, but we'll get into that in other videos. Today, I want to discuss a couple of things. The first is the background to the EFF election manifesto. What is the context into which this manifesto falls? Then I want to look into some of the proposals inside this manifesto. There are some new things, but it's also a large continuity of EFF policy and manifesto proposals in the past. And then after that, look at some of the strengths and the weaknesses in the manifesto. And then we can conclude looking forward to this election because there are going to be a number of manifestos unfolding in this election cycle, and we'll be keeping a very close eye on all of them. Just to say, I'm recording this very soon after the EFF manifesto actually came out. It's like 266 pages. And so this is an immediate reaction, but there will be deeper reflection on the manifesto as the election rolls out. This is just a first take. So let's start with the context, because before we dive into the manifesto, I think it's important to understand what's going on around this manifesto so that you can understand it in more depth. And the first thing is, this manifesto comes just a few days after President Cyril Ramaphosa delivered his State of the Nation address. Look out for an, inter, uh, uh, an anal analysis video where I'm going to look at that State of the Nation address. Dinzualo, we're coming for the Dinzualo story. But uh, the, the State of the Nation address was really a key moment in the ANC election campaign because it gave President Cyril Ramaphosa an uninterrupted attempt to convince South African voters of the ANC's message, the progress that the government has made. And of course, what was important about the SONA is that EFMPs weren't there. In protest over six EFMPs being charged for disciplinary reasons based on the last SONA, the whole EFF caucus wasn't there. So this is one of the first SONAs where we saw uh, President Cyril Ramaphosa, any president uh, in a long time, just being able to deliver their address without any interruption. And so there was an interesting week in South African politics, a SONA and then an EFF manifesto. And in many ways, this manifesto was a response to the SONA. Of course, we can't deny that there was a second thing in the background. Stage six is back, people. Stage six. You thought it was gone. You thought it was gone. Stage six is back like it never left. And on the day of the EFF manifesto, stage six load shedding happened. And it was just a reminder in many ways of where we are as a country. After the SONA, tried to paint a very, shall we say, rosy picture of the current state of the nation. And then we had some election polls, which would make for pleasant reading for the EFF to the extent that they are now being placed at least above the 15% mark. Remember in the last election, they were just over about 10% or so. I've consistently said if they get anything from 15 and above, they will and they should be happy. And a few recent polls put them above 15. So in terms of that context, which I'm going to dive into in a, in a later video, that's really the background of this uh, this manifesto launch. Now, in addition, the EFF set itself a very ambitious task to fill up the 50 to 60,000 Moses Mabida Stadium. By the way, sidebar, why is everyone launching the election manifesto at the same stadium in this election? The EFF is launching at Moses Mabida. A few weeks later, the ANC is going to Moses Mabida to launch its manifesto. And then the IFP is also going to Moses Mabida to launch, launch its manifesto. So it's a curious fact that in this election, three of the five biggest parties in South Africa will all be launching their manifestos in exactly the same stadium. It shows the importance of KZN in this election and that KZN will be one of the most fascinating places to watch. Did the EFF fill up the stadium? I think they did enough. Um... I looked at some of the videos. One of our analysts, Mighty Jamie, was actually there. He did like a 360 panoramic view of the stadium just before uh, Julius Malema came out to speak. 
and it was full enough. It wasn't necessarily bursting to full capacity. There were a few empty seats here and there, but it certainly wasn't a disaster. And when you're having a manifesto at a stadium, you want to make sure that it's full enough uh, and that, you know, it, it looks like there aren't major sections where there are empty seats. And, and the EFF didn't have that at the crucial moment. Of course, a stadium is as full as it is at any given point. And I think after the rain uh, affected the the speech of Julius Malema, there were people who left the stadium. And at that point, it wasn't as full as when he was uh, arriving. But largely speaking, what you want to do is avoid a crisis, kind of like the Patriotic Alliance had when they tried to launch or celebrate 10 years at a stadium. And um, I think it was clear for all to see that it was very empty. So the, the EFF went to KZN. Now, all the EFF election manifesto launches have been in Gauteng before that, largely. I think they did one in, in they've done like big events in the Northwest as well. But this is the first time that they went out of their comfort zone, as it were. So they were trying to show that outside of Gauteng, outside of Limpopo, outside of the Northwest, they could go to a province where they're not necessarily as big as they are in other provinces and still pull off a big rally. And I think they just about sent that message. Although, of course, I mean, it, it wasn't like one of the Gauteng rallies where they were able to fall 110,000 people into FNB as they did in, in a previous election. But all in all, I don't think that they lost out on the optics. Um, there were a few moments where they, where they probably didn't do as well as they really wanted to. But to go to KZN and fill up a stadium um, like they did is, is I think, a, a good optical look. Optically speaking, I think the speech itself... Um, had some problems, A, because it looked like uh, Julius Malema was sick or, or his sinuses were affecting him. So his voice was getting very hoarse and you could hear by the end he was really like shouting the end of the speech. And um, and so that wasn't necessarily the best look. And of course, I mean, there's nothing you can do about the fact that he had like sinuses, but, um, you know, th that optically wasn't ideal either. So I think... All in all, in terms of the backdrop, the stage was then set for what is the EFF going to say? And let's go and look at some of the key proposals in the manifesto now that were both announced at, and that are in the document. Um, and, you know, you can find the docu document online easily. Thanks for watching SMWX. Before we get back to the episode, I just wanted to let you know the four ways that you can help support this channel if you want to see us growing bigger and better to keep you more entertained and informed. The first way is you can invite me to speak at your company, your school, your institution. You'll see the contact details down below. The second way is that you can become a member of this channel. Become a member or you can give us a thanks. You'll see there's like a heart with a dollar sign in the ribbon below this video. Buy me and the team some coffee for this episode. The third way you can get involved is you can advertise on the channel. Now, I'd much rather the community of viewers would be advertisers on this channel than me going out to people who don't really know about SMWX and trying to explain it to them. So if you're a viewer and you have a business and you want to partner and you love this platform, let's partner on this channel. And then finally, you can buy merchandise, you can buy books. All this is in the description down below. Now let's get back to the episode. So let's come into this section. Uh, let's call it part two. And we are now going to look at what the EFF has actually proposed. Now, the EFF, you know, has these seven cardinal pillars, which it has stood on ever since its formation in 2013. And it has been very consistent about its policy positions and its manifestos have all largely been driven and centered around those Seven, plank, uh, seven cardinal planks of the EFF's vision. So this manifesto is very much a continuity and a continuation of past manifestos. But there were some interesting new additions that I'd like to look at, which I think uh, deserve reflection. So the first thing is that, as usual with the EFF, you know that land is always going to be front and center. So their whole uh, election motto I'm not so sure about this election motto because the EFF is always land and jobs now. It's been doing like land and jobs for a lot of different elections. 
it would have been nice, I think. I, I know that's their focus, but it would have been nice to have like a new tagline, you know, because we've heard land and jobs now before. Just from a communications perspective, like if I was a, a communications manager for a party in this election, I would have a message like make history. You need to tell people that if they vote in this election, they could do something that has never been done, which is bring the ANC below 50%, you know, and you can be a part of that historical moment. Um, but th so their motto is land and jobs and then um, end load shedding as well. So they've added that on to the usual motto. So, you know, land, unemployment and load shedding are the, the, the key focus, focus areas of this manifesto. So what are they saying on land that is interesting or noteworthy? Well, the one thing when you look, in, look at the manifesto, and Julius Malema didn't necessarily explicate this fully in his speech, but they actually have an entire constitutional amendment. I've, I've never seen this before in any manifesto, I must say. Like, and, and they've got the wording of that amendment inside the manifesto. So they want, as everyone knows, they want to amend section 25 of the constitution, section 25 being the property clause, to make it easier for expropriation without compensation of land to happen. And in order to do this, and in order to amend the constitution to make that easier, they've actually put the text of that amendment into their manifesto. So uh, it's an interesting um, piece of text, and, and I want to I want to bring it up for you because they actually show what they want to what they want to do with the with the manifesto, which uh, with, with the constitution, which I think is actually quite quite novel. So they give you section 25 on page 29 and and they say that section 25 one will read the state including parliament the executive and the judiciary carries an obligation to redress imbalances of the past through enactment of laws that will achieve redress and equitably redistribute all resources and then subsection 2 of 25 would then say property may be expropriated without compensation may be expropriated without compensation. And then the subsection of that would be 2A, which is that only in terms of law of general application and B, for a public purpose or a public interest. So they're really flipping around uh, section 25, 1 and 2. Currently, section 25, 1, I think, is the is the clause about uh, property is 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 enshrined but it can't be you can't be in you can't be arbitrarily deprived of property they want to shift that around and talk about the need for the state to redress past imbalances and then in two they want to bring out the explicit uh clause about you you may expropriate without compensation now what's important about this is that it's not saying must which is uh, the key distinction in most legal texts between must and may so what they are saying is that the state has a possibility to expropriate without compensation under certain conditions, and then they list those conditions. One, under a law of general application, which basically means legislation that applies to everyone must provide the conditions under which, if expropriation is going to happen, it happens under these conditions. And that's quite an interesting point, just as we step back, because one of the key things that South Africa has been missing for a very long time is what we could call a land redistribution bill, which is different from an expropriation bill, which is just about what the state does with its own land. But how would we redistribute land in terms of not just land that's owned by the state, but also privately owned land in a way that would be orderly, in a way that would be sustainable, that would meet the developmental goals of South Africa, but would also be just and equitable given South Africa's long history of violent land dispossession. And we sadly have not had a bill in Parliament proposed to tell us exactly how that would work. And so this is what this, this law of general application, which is already in the Constitution, would do. But it would clearly be about giving effect to this may be expropriated without compensation, which would be quite a different um, thrust of that law. And then for a public purpose or in the public interest. So I think that's largely a reiteration. Then they want to make the state the custodian of all land in South Africa. Uh, and so they've got a series of other proposals, which I would invite you to look at in more depth about how they're going to remove certain sections of Sen uh, Section 25 and add their new sections of S Section 25 to basically 
in their minds, remove the ambiguity that surrounds Section 25 when it comes to expropriation without compensation and also make the state the custodian of all land in South Africa. Now, that kind of proposal has been around for a long time within the EFF. They've explicated exactly what they would see the Constitution reading. And clearly, the EFF is going big on land and expropriation without compensation. That's how they open their manifesto. And this is the, the new spice that they've added is explicating exactly how they would change the constitution. Let's go to another issue which comes up in this manifesto, which is the second one really raised, and that is this question of load shedding. I'm surprised you're even able to watch this episode at this point. So thank you for, for making time for SMWX when you probably don't even have lights for a lot of the day. But the EFF is again going quite big on this question of load shedding, and I'd like to talk about some of their proposals there. So the EFF has come out swinging on the side of coal generation. So there's a big debate in this election about do we pursue a more renewable energy path, which is better for the environment, but probably takes longer and may keep us in load shedding longer, or do we go down a more coal-driven path, which is worse for the environment, but probably better for uh, short-term load shedding. And also, there's also the question of jobs in the coal mining industry. Now, the EFF has come out unequivocally saying, yes, renewables can come down the line at some future date, but they're going to double down, focus on coal, and make sure that coal remains the key element of South Africa's energy mix going forward. So if you're interested in that debate, the EFF is on the side of erring on the extreme of retaining coal and keeping that as a key element of our energy mix going forward in the next five years. Um, other than that, a lot of the proposals in the energy sector, I think, are things that are already in existence and the EFF has reiterated them. And when I come to the strengths and the, and the weaknesses of the, of the manifesto, I will uh, put that as one weakness, that some of the things that are proposed are already being done. Maybe they're just not being implemented, but then in which case I would have expected the manifesto to say, this is how we'll implement them differently rather than just reiterate them, reiterating them. Then finally, we're going to come to some proposals on education, which I found quite interesting. So as you probably know, the EFF has been a very loud proponent of free education for everyone. So not just NSFAS, but every single person would be eligible to get free education. Now, the real question about the EFF's free education proposal um, is, is the cost, but I'm going to come back to that again when I discuss strengths and weaknesses, because I think there is a question looming over this manifesto about exactly how much it would all cost and whether the EFF has been able to convince people through the manifesto, not only that these things are desirable, but that they're feasible. Um, so, so there's that. There's an interesting proposal about early childhood development, about uh, 40,000 new practitioners being employed to make early childhood development compulsory for children from the age of three. So currently this is not compulsory. We know the early childhood uh, development sector is a key sector for South Africa's growth. It's so central to education because education is not just about what you do at university it's about all those skills that you gain right from being very young in fact many countries focus on even the effect on pregnant women of the educational environment on, on a child while still in utero so the earlier you start with the education uh, investment the better so that's an interesting proposal that stood out to me because um, you know really redoubling efforts on early childhood development is not only a good way to improve employment on the one hand, but also education outcomes on the other. So those are just some, some just a, a smattering of the, of the offerings. Um, I think the one other key thrust of the manifesto, which I want to point out, is that there's a lot of focus on law enforcement. Uh, there, there are huge sections about police visibility, about the criminal justice system as a whole. There's a criminal justice reform agenda that's threaded throughout this manifesto. So big police visibility, uh, even military visibility in some cases, um, uh, the employment of many, many more police, 
Uh, when it comes to the judiciary, uh, they want to change sentences for various offenses. Uh, so, you know, targeting a police officer would carry a larger uh, sentence with no prospect of a pardon. There are uh, different kinds of um, crimes like murder, which which they want to increase the sentence for and reduce the opportunity of clemency for as well. Um, so there's a lot of focus on the state's apparatus involved in policing and making that more visible and more present and then looking at the criminal justice system as a whole and looking at reforms in terms of sentencing. Um, We'll come again to that in the strengths and weaknesses section. So that's just a sense of the EFF's uh, stance. What they do in the manifesto at the beginning is they show the the successes of the EFF and they talk about the payback the money campaign they talk about the electoral victories and growth of the EFF over time they talk about some of the things they've they claim they've been able to do in municipalities they talk about how many representatives they have across South Africa and it is quite impressive to think that the EFF is you know pushing towards being nearly as big as the DA in this in this election but what they haven't been able to do is really governed for a very long period of time. And so in some ways, they are putting together a few different uh, achievements that don't necessarily give a strong track record of governance because the fact of the matter is the EFF hasn't been able to govern in large enough places for long enough to have a true governance track record. So let's come to some of the... Let's try and weigh up some of the proposals and see where the strengths and the weaknesses in the EFF manifesto lie. So as far as the strengths are concerned, what I have always maintained about the EFF is that I think the EFF's diagnosis of South Africa's problems is actually quite accurate. Comparing it to the SONA, for example, the EFF starts off by just saying, okay, where do we see the problem in South Africa lying before we go into our manifesto? And They talk about 1994 not really being this watershed moment that we think of it as. Uh, I think that's important, and someone in this election needs to say that. They talk about uh, racial inequality and the way that the economy is still disproportionately owned in white hands in South Africa. And there's no doubt about that. It's often not appreciated enough. People skirt around it. The EFF gets right into the diagnosis, and and they say that's the problem we're going to fix. Uh, many parties are not very big on land. The EFF thinks land needs to needs to be addressed urgently, and I I, I agree. I I think that's that's true. Um, so they paint a very negative and worrying picture of the South African reality, which at least resonates with me. I think we do have a much more worrying picture than than many people actually appreciate. Um, the section twenty five thing. The explicitness of it may be, it really depends where you stand on the land question. So so I happen to think Section 25 is ambiguous, um, and I've written in detail why. If you want to read about that, you can read in, in my book, The New Apartheid, where I, I do a whole section on Section 25. But it's difficult to know exactly how expropriation without compensation, if it is to be achieved or if it is um sought by a government would happen within the context of section 25 both theoretically and even if it's possible theoretically whether it would be possible practically given how long things take in the south african court system what i do think is interesting is actually saying like giving the wording of the legislation or the constitutional amendment that you would propose and i think more parties should do that actually in an ideal world what would be cool i know this is asking a lot but hey Imagine a party could come before an election and say, we want to introduce these five bills in parliament and we've already drafted them and you can go and read them. Here are the bills. That would be a real you know, step forward rather than just saying we kind of want to do this and we kind of want to do that. Give us the legislation that we can vote for and then you have a real clear sense. So I think that's, that's important as well. Um, I want to come on to some... some some weaknesses, because I think it is important to to reflect on these. And as we go through manifestos on this channel, once again, just in case you haven't heard it for the for the hundredth time, this platform is not for 
any of the political parties. I am not a member of any political party in South Africa. I do have my own opinions on South Africa and I analyze South Africa through those views, but it's not linked to any political party. So what we're going to try and do on this channel is look at manifestos, look at the strengths, the weaknesses, and help you decide which party resonates with you. The thing that has always hindered the EFF in my view, and I think the thing that still lingers over this manifesto, is that the promises sound appealing. Free education. Who could, I mean, when you look at it, do you want to pay for education or not? No, actually. Um, I don't know how many different state, new state-owned institutions are proposed in this manifesto. Everything from new research institutions to bolstering mining companies and new mining companies to buy coal mines or, or own coal mines linked to ESCOM and then building out the state-owned mining company. There are going to be municipal entities. There's going to be a consolidated state asset company. There are potentially dozens, if not hundreds, of new forms of state institution that could flow from this manifesto. All of these proposals, expanding radically expanding social grants um, up to uh, those who receive uh, income grants up to up to four thousand rand, uh, four thousand one hundred and twenty or something. All of this has an economic cost, and. It's not clear to me from the manifesto, and it, it, I don't think it has ever been made explicitly clear exactly how that's going to be funded. So there's an extent to which the EFF is making promises, but it's not clear whether those promises are in fact feasible. Now, could they be feasible? Maybe. But one would need to see very detailed analysis in terms of free education is going to cost this amount. I've seen analyses. We're going to have a conversation with an expert on this soon, but it's around 50 billion, right, to, to currently do the free education that's limited that we have now, somewhere around there. Now, if you're going to radically increase that to everyone, are you talking 60 billion, 70 billion? That's 10, 20 billion in a fiscus that's already constrained because of many years of fiscal mismanagement in South Africa. Now, the EFF's response is a section on fiscal management where they claim that they're going to be able to raise taxes significantly. So they're going to institute a wealth tax. They're going to impose all kinds of other kinds of taxes on the South African system. But at the same time, they say they're going to reduce VAT down to 14% again, which is a key tax and a key source of revenue. So they're reducing one source, they're increasing other taxes, but Oh, and then they say that they're also going to deal with illicit financial flows. So all these companies that like let assets go out of the country without it ever being known, cash leaving the country without it ever actually being declared. Wonder where we've heard that before, the way cash comes in and out of the country. So that's all well and good, but that's hard. If If, if that was an easy thing to do, then we'd be doing it. The problem is, these corporations are more sophisticated than the government, far more sophisticated than the government often. And so how would the South African state become more sophisticated than these massive multinational companies at the same time as we know that the South African state is you know, not doing well at collecting the revenue that it needs to collect right now, or at least its, its capacity extends to what it can already do. So just saying there will be a wealth tax doesn't look at how very wealthy people are very smart at getting around these tax mechanisms. And so I'm not convinced that the EFF in this manifesto makes a case that the, all the noble things that it wants to achieve would also be appropriately costed and are actually feasible to implement. And that's the the... That's the test I'm setting the EFF in this election. That's the challenge I'm putting to them as I'm going to put challenges to all parties. What the EFF needs to do is not just make these bold promises, which I think resonate with a lot of people, but spend a lot of time explaining to the extent that it believes it's possible how. Because when I look at the manifesto, like I look at many other manifestos, and to be fair, this is one of the more detailed manifestos. Um, there's a lot of telling us what is going to happen 
we should do this, we should do this, we should do this. But there's not a lot of telling us how that will happen. And that's the question voters have in their minds. How would we achieve free education while still maintaining a stable fiscus so that we didn't go into massive amounts of dollar-denominated debt, for example, that we would ultimately have to pay back down the line and our debt service costs would get bigger. And, you know, how, how are they going to square that circle of we've got this big government debt? Do they think we need more debt? Because some economists will say, well, debt, okay, debt looks like this big, scary thing, but you can manage an economy like Japan, for example, with big debt uh, so long as, you know, you put other things in place. But the South African economy is very different to the Japanese economy. And so we are servicing a lot of debt at the moment, and that's taking away from developmental priorities. So how would we do all these massive, massive things that are probably going to cost hundreds of billions, if not approaching a trillion, honestly, a trillion, maybe more, with expanding social grants, you know? Um, how much is that going to cost, and how, how do we find the finances for that? I'm not saying it's impossible, necessarily. I do think a bold, ambitious fiscal stance is potentially... Uh, crucial for South Africa, but not just uh, blindly. It has to be very carefully uh, thought through. So um, an economist like Dumat Kubule has spent a lot of time thinking about this. Um, so that's, that's for me, um, where the EFF manifesto still holds a challenge. That's effectively, in a nutshell, just a first take on the EFF manifesto. Of course, Read it for yourself, analyze it for yourself. I'm just trying to give give you a, a map and a landscape for where the EFF is heading in this election. There's a lot of stuff you can also go and check out, like little proposals here and there that are different. They want to cut down cabinet to half its current size and re eliminate all deputy ministers. I'm all for that. I'm all for that. And that's something that the government can do. The president can decide the size of his cabinet and he can cut the cabinet and remove deputy ministers. I think we would all celebrate something like that. And so have a look, have a read. What did you think of the speech? What do you think of the context of the manifesto? Let's conclude now. What are your thoughts on the way that the optics worked? Do you think it was a good idea to go to Moses Mabida and KZN? Did the EFF pull it off? What are your thoughts on this happening right in the middle of stage six and after the sonar? What are your thoughts on the manifesto itself? whether it lives up to the promise or whether it is uh, unfit. What are your thoughts on some of the proposals on land, the economy, ESCOM, state capacity, uh, and especially law enforcement and that kind of thing? Let's have a conversation because that's what this election is all about. Putting ideas across, debating them, uh, making the political parties know what we like, what we don't like, and we will, this is the first in our series, of manifesto reviews, but we'll be here for the ANC manifesto and the DA manifesto and perhaps a, a few other manifestos as this unfolds. This has been an emergency episode of SMWX in the immediate aftermath of the EFF's manifesto launch. Like, share, subscribe, comment down below, and let's continue to spread the fire on SMWX. Your like boosts this channel and makes it bigger. Your share boosts this channel and makes it bigger. Your subscription boosts this channel and makes it bigger. So if you haven't done one of those three things, then you could be in a worse situation than Dinswalo in the last five years. Spread the fire. Ayeye. Ay.